And today we're going to talk more about discipleship. We've been talking about what it means to be a disciple for almost a year now. We've taken out a few Sundays on holidays and special occasions to talk about some other things. But we've been talking about what does it mean to be a disciple in the, first, in the 21st century. It's easy for us to look through the scriptures in the New Testament and see what it looked like to be a disciple in the Jewish culture of the first century on the other side of the planet from where we live. But what does it look like to be a disciple today in the boot heel of Missouri. What is that supposed to look like? And that's what we've been talking about. Uh, we've been looking at some foundational scriptures about discipleship. And today we're going to continue that thought. We're going to talk today um, about the fact that disciples are servants. Disciples are servants. Jesus made an enlightening statement. He said this in Mark chapter 10, verse number, 30, or number 43. He was speaking to his disciples. And, and this is what he told them. He said, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Speaking to disciples, he said, if you want to be a great disciple, if you want to be a really authentic disciple, if you really want to be a world-changing disciple, then you must be a servant. He that would be great among you must be your servant. And so let's pray today and ask God, what should that look like in our lives? Father, I thank you for this powerful statement that Jesus made. I pray that today you'll help us apply this to our own lives and help it to become relevant to us so that we can see what it means to be a disciple as far as being a servant is concerned in our world today. Lord, help us to answer that question. How do I know how I'm supposed to serve? Since there are so many different ways to serve, how am I supposed to serve? Lord, help us to have a better understanding of that today as we look at your word. Send your Holy Spirit to be our teacher and just show us some incredible things from Scripture today and then burn them deeply into our hearts so that we won't be able to rest until we have applied them to our lives, making us better servants and therefore better disciples. I pray that in Jesus' name and for his sake. And amen. amen. Now, as I've already said, Jesus made an enlightening statement to his disciples. And that statement that we just read should teach an important life lesson to every believer. Jesus never said anything accidentally or unintentionally. Everything he said, he said with a purpose. And everything he said was intended to teach us something important about life. The statement that he made was, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. So the lesson that we can learn here is that greatness in God's kingdom is determined by one's willingness to be a servant. Greatness in God's kingdom is not about your ability to preach dramatically. Greatness in God's kingdom is not about your ability to sing on key. Greatness in God's kingdom is not about your ability to persuade people. It's not about your ability to do this or that or something else. It's about your willingness to be a servant. That's what greatness in God's kingdom is based on. And when Jesus paused long enough to describe his own life mission, he said this. I find this intriguing. When Jesus stopped long enough to tell us why he came, this is what he said in Matthew chapter 20, verse number 28. He said, the Son of Man, that's what Jesus almost always called himself, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So Jesus came to earth to serve and to give. He came to earth to serve, that is to be a servant. The Greek word translated serve refers to the meeting of basic needs in order to influence others for Jesus. When we are serving, we have seen a basic need in the life of somebody else and we go about meeting that need, but our ulterior motive is to influence them for Jesus. Any government agency can meet a need. But no government agency is designed, at least in America today, to meet a need in order to influence people for Jesus. In fact, unfortunately, our government has gotten to the place where if it's a government program, you're not supposed to influence people for Jesus. What a crime, what a pity, what a disaster that is for our country. And so you see, what disciples do is they meet basic needs in order to influence people 
for Jesus. You do realize that's why we have our food pantry and clothes closet, right? The two basic needs that people have are food and clothing, physical needs, food and clothing. And, and so we, we provide a basic need, but it's not just the food and the clothing. Why do we give away food and clothing? Because it gives us the opportunity to tell people the Jesus story. And everybody who comes to get food and clothing hears the Jesus story, whether they want to or not. I know that may be a violation of somebody's civil rights, according to our government, but I want you to understand that as Christians, we are commanded by a higher authority to tell the Jesus story to make disciples of everyone, to preach the good news to every creature. And so we meet basic needs. We serve in order to influence people for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's just what disciples do. And that's why he explained to his disciples, whoever wants to be great among you, among my disciples, if you want to be a great disciple, then you must be a servant. Serving isn't optional. To be a great disciple, it's mandatory. That's why he used the word must be your servant. Must is not a suggestion. Must is mandatory. Must means it's a command. It's not optional. And so we got to understand that. If we're ever going to be the kind of disciple that Jesus wants us to be, we've got to be willing to serve. And sometimes serving is messy. Are you aware of that? Sometimes it's dirty. Sometimes it's smelly. Sometimes it takes you into places where you would rather not be. That's just the way serving is. And so you've got to roll up your sleeves and be willing to get dirty and messy if you're going to serve the way Jesus wants you to serve. So then the question is this. I, often when I, when I preach about disciples as servants afterwards, someone will come to me and they'll say, well, there are dozens of different ways to serve. So how do I know how God wants me to serve? In which ministry should I serve? And then as always, the Bible has the answer. And we've been talking about that for the last couple of weeks. We've talked about the fact that, that the Bible gives us the answer uh, to help us determine how we should serve. And, 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 and the idea is that by determining the particular grace gift that you have been given, you can begin to recognize how God has designed you to serve. And I got to tell you this, no two of us serve in the same way. You get that? No two of us serve in the same way because no two of us are just alike. No two of us have the same capacities, the same intellect, the same innate abilities that God has designed into us. No two of us have the same set of skills, and so we don't serve in the same way. Let me give you an example. Most of you know Dickie Smith. Wave, Dickie. You know Dickie Smith. I want to give you an example. Miss Jenny and I bought an old mobile home um, several weeks ago, and we're in the process of fixing that thing up to rent it out, and, and we discovered that the people that we bought it from left a vacuum cleaner in there. And it works. It's not a real good vacuum cleaner, but it's a vacuum cleaner that works. But it's dirty, and it, it kind of squeals and squalls and you know, that kind of stuff. It needs some cleaning and some fine-tuning and, and some stuff that Dickie Smith knows how to do. So when I got to church this morning, I said, Dickie, I have a ministry opportunity for you. And he said, oh, no, not again. And, you know, I said, this one is easy. And he said, you say that every time. <laughs> but here's the deal. The deal is he can do that. If it was left up to me to do that, I'd just throw it away and go get another vacuum cleaner because I do not know how to fix it and fine-tune it and all that stuff. But he can do that. So you see, God has gifted each of us and designed each of us to serve in particular ways, and we don't all do the same thing. I mean, I, we just don't all do the same thing. Many of you, we just, we're in the middle of deer season, right? How many deer hunters we got here? Praise God. You know why I say that? If you are all designed like me, we would be overrun with wildlife. I want you to understand, I am not a hunter in any sense of the word. Praise God for those who are, because they keep the wildlife population under control. Everybody is designed differently to do different things. Things And we need to get a hold of that. And one of the ways that God has designed each of us is he has given us one of seven grace gifts. This is a particular category of gifts that's described for us by Paul in Romans chapter 12. And there are seven of them. And every 
Christian has one and only one of these. There are another category of, descri- of gifts described by Paul over in the book of 1 Corinthians, and, and you may have multiple of those gifts, but this particular kind of gift, everybody only has one. Let me show you how you, you gotta, you gotta get hold of this. This is what Paul wrote in Romans 12, verses four to six. He wrote, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. Did you get that? One body, many members. That's the way each church is. One body, many members. And if you could read that in Greek, it's actually many different kinds of members. And isn't that what our, our physical bodies have? We only got one body, but it's got all different kinds of members. And do all of those members do the same thing? You'd be in big trouble if they did. I mean, think about your liver trying to smell. You know, think about your feet trying to talk. I, I, we could go on and on, and it gets pretty bizarre. All of the members don't do the same thing. The members are all designed uniquely and specifically and with great creativity to do exactly what they're supposed to do to contribute to the health of the body. And so it is with the body of Christ. So it is with His church. Each of us has one body and many members. These members do not all have the same function. And so in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We are intricately connected, so intricately connected in the body of Christ that we belong to each other. And belonging to each other means that we are interdependent upon each other. That if you don't do what you're supposed to do, then it's going to affect me negatively. And if I don't do what I'm supposed to do, that's going to affect you negatively. We are interdependent upon each other, all belonging together together contributing to the health of the body of Christ. Now, I want you to get this. If the members of the body don't all have the same function, and you got all this variety of different kinds of members in the body, and no two churches have the same members, isn't that true? No two churches have the same members. Then should any, be, any two churches be exactly alike, doing the same thing, having the same program? Should they? No. And you know why that is? That was good, wasn't it? That's because, that's because no two communities anywhere on the planet have exactly the same needs. Different people, different issues, different backgrounds, different misunderstandings, different ideas. No two communities of people anywhere on the planet have the same basic needs. And so as a result of that, when God puts a church in that community, God puts members in that church and he gifts them so that they can meet the particular specialized needs of the folks in that community. So as many different kinds of communities as there are in the world, there ought to be that many different kinds of churches. Churches that are all made up of disciples following the Lord Jesus Christ, but they don't look exactly alike. They don't do exactly the same thing. Oh, they all serve, but they don't all serve in exactly the same way. Do you understand that? That's what's wrong with a lot of denominational churches where somebody in a denominational office sits down and draws up a blueprint for what the church ought to look like and what the program ought to be and what the church ought to be doing and then sends it out to all these churches and they all try to be little little carbon copies of one another, and that's very ineffective because no two communities are just alike. Every church ought to be exactly what God has designed it to be to meet the basic needs of people in its community in order to influence them for Jesus. Do you understand that? So don't get all upset when people say, man, that church is weird. There's not another church around doing what that church is doing. There's something wrong with that church. No, there's something very right with that church. Do you understand that? And I I recognize that every church in, in the United States should not be doing what the Open Door Church is doing. We are radically different than most churches because we just look for basic needs and how can we meet the need to influence people for Jesus. And that makes you look different, a little weird kind of dysfunctional, but that's okay. That's very okay. The first church, the church that Jesus built, experienced that same thing. 
The religious folks of the day thought there was something radically wrong with this new movement that Jesus started that became his church. And it's going to be that way in the world when the church is doing what the church is supposed to be doing. You get that. So it's okay when people say, you're a cult. You're weird. I don't want to go to that church. That, ch that, church, got, that church got convicts. That church got druggies and alcoholics. That church got this. That church got that. That church got something else. We need to say, praise God. Amen. Praise God. And so we got to understand that. So we determine our grace gift, and, and then, and then that, that determines how we function in the body, and then that determines how the body functions in the community. We do not all have the same function. So, so he says, in Christ, we, though many, form one body. Each of the members belongs to the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. That's why I call these gifts grace gifts, because they are determined by God's grace as he gives it to us. And you know God's grace is his goodwill. But did you get that? Did you get that? We do not all have the same function because we have different gifts. Just because somebody else doesn't do what you do doesn't mean there's something wrong with either you or them. It just means that God has designed you to serve in different ways. Now, he has designed you to serve, but he may have designed you to serve differently than somebody else. The particular grace gift that we have been given determines how we are to serve, how we are to function as a member of the Lord's church, as a part of the body of Christ. Paul wrote this. And, 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 and this is in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 to 8. He wrote, if your gift is prophesying, I love this, this is so simple, then prophesy <laughs> in accordance with your faith. In other words, if, if, if your gift is the gift of prophesying, and in the New Testament, that particular gift is just the ability to explain the mind of God based on the Word of God under the leadership of the Spirit of God. That's what it is. So if you've got that particular gift, then what are you supposed to do? Use that gift. And, and do what God has designed you to do. Don't try to do everything else. Sometimes people get upset because they think everybody in the church ought to be doing, you know, participate in everything. No. No. You're supposed to do what you're designed to do. Let other people do what they're designed to do. We don't all have to do it. But we all have to do something. Do you get that? Everybody doesn't do everything, but everybody does something. That's the way it's designed to be in the body. So if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. Now, you know, a while ago I said you only have one of these. Look at the pronouns here. If it is prophesying, if your gift, it, is prophesying, then prophesy. How many is it? Singular, isn't it? Just one. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, then do it diligently. And if it is to show mercy, then do it cheerfully. Before every one of those, he used that singular pronoun, it, which means you only have one of these. You may have multiple of those kind of gifts over in 1 Corinthians, but of these gifts, you only have one, because these gifts determine your perspective. These gifts determines how you look at your community and your perspective is, this needs to be done for the people in my community, and then that's what you give yourself to. It sets your perspective. Paul listed seven gifts, prophecy, service, teaching, encouraging, giving, leading, and mercy, and he indicated that every believer has, has one and only one of these gifts, and your gift determines how you are designed to serve. Therefore, to determine your area of service, you must identify your gift. You've got to identify your gift. Now, we have already looked at the gifts of prophecy, serving, and teaching. We already looked at those. Prophecy is the ability and, and the motivation to explain right and wrong 
And, and these people generally see everything in black and white. There is no gray. It's either right or it's wrong, and they're usually very vocal about that. Serving is the motivation to see and to meet those basic needs. These are the busy beavers in the church. They always see something that needs to be done, and they're willing to jump in and do that. And then teaching, that's the ability to clarify, the motivation to, to clarify that what is being taught is actually true and accurate. These people want to do a lot of research, and they want to dot every I and cross every T because they are sticklers for truth in the minute detail. We've already looked at those. Today we're going to briefly examine the gifts of encouraging and giving, two more of the gifts, and then next week we'll look at the gifts of leading and mercy, and we will have covered all seven of those, and hopefully by the time we finish this thing you will have at least some idea of what your gift might be so you can begin to serve according to the motivation of your gift. You can determine what area of service you need to be engaged in. So let's talk about the gift of encouraging. The gift of encouraging. I believe this is the gift that God has given me. He doesn't give everybody that gift, but he gives some people this gift. The fourth grace gift that he listed is, is, is to encourage. This is what he wrote in verse number eight. He wrote, if it, that is your gift, is to encourage, then give encouragement. The gift of encouraging is the God-given motivation to help believers experience spiritual growth. That's what it is. This gift is the gift that says you have come to know Jesus and you are at level number one. Now you need to move up to level number two and then up to level number three and then up to level number four. And the person with the gift of encouragement is never satisfied with you where you are because they can always visualize what you could be with a little more encouragement, with a little more discipling, with a little more motivation. And so they're never satisfied with leaving you where you are. That is this gift of encouraging. In Scripture, Paul best illustrates the, the, the believer with the gift of encouraging. And so if we, if we look at the life of Paul as it's revealed to us in Scripture, that will help us learn a few characteristics about the encouragers among us. And I don't have time to give you a whole list of these, but I want to give you three of them today. These people tend to be focused. They tend to be focused. Encouragers are focused on the spiritual growth of other believers. When they think, about them questions form in their minds like this. What can I say that will motivate them to do the things that will help them grow to spiritual maturity? How can I word this? How can I put this? How can I explain this? So that they will be motivated to take the next step. So that they will be motivated to move one step closer to becoming the person that God wants them to be. Paul expressed that kind of focus when he wrote to the believers at Colossae. This is what he wrote. It's in Colossians 1, 28. He, referring to Jesus, he is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone in all wisdom. Now, here it is. So that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. Do you get that? What's he want for them? Maturity. He wants them to grow up in their faith. He wants them to continue up those levels of discipleship and commitment and, and, and love for Jesus until they become fully mature, and he's not going to rest until that happens. That's why the whole basis of everything else that he does, when he proclaims Jesus, when he admonishes and teaches people about Jesus, when he tries to share wisdom with people, his deal is that someday when he stands before Jesus, he doesn't want to stand there with a bunch of baby Christians around him that never grew up in their faith. He wants to stand there and be able to present to Jesus as an offering to him a whole host of people who not only got saved, but grew in their faith to the point that they were mature enough to help other people get saved and grow up in their faith as well. And so that was his focus. It was a focus on the spiritual maturity of other people. And then discerning discerning. Encouragers can easily discern the level of spiritual maturity in other believers. Paul discerned spiritual immaturity in the believers at Corinth when he ministered to them. And, and then that determined how he ministered to them. He could, he could spend a little while with those people and by what they said and by their attitude and, 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 and what they were doing and what they weren't doing, he could determine that, that there was a level of spiritual immaturity there. And so this is what he wrote to them. He wrote, 
I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, people controlled by the Spirit. That's kind of tough, wasn't it? I'd like to be able to speak to you as if you were spiritual, but you're not. Isn't that what he's saying? He just kind of laid it out there. I, I, I would like to, to do that. I, but brethren, I could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal. You know what carnal means? Controlled by the flesh. Spiritual is controlled by the spirit. Carnal is controlled controlled by the flesh. What he was telling them is that I discern some spiritual immaturity in you. The Spirit of God is not in control of your life. Your flesh is still in control of your life. And then he says this, as to babes in Christ. What is he saying? You've never grown up in your faith. You're still immature. You're still acting like baby Christians. He just laid it out there for him. He could discern that. He recognized that. And then he said, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. He said, I had to give you the milk of the word. You're still like a baby Christian nursing at his mother's breast. You haven't grown up even enough to eat solid food. I couldn't give you some good solid food from the word of God because you were so immature you couldn't take it. And even now, you are still not able, for you are still carnal, still controlled by the flesh. What was he saying? I can see this in you. I can discern this. And so when he reached out to them, when he wrote to them, he explained to them, the reason I'm writing this stuff to you is because you are immature Christians. Now, I love this. He wrote 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians to this same group of people. And I am amazed when people want to take the books of 1 and 2 Corinthians and say, we need to model ourselves after this. Think about that. What that means is that you, you want to apply to yourself stuff that needed to be applied to a church because it was full of baby Christians who had refused to grow up. Not new Christians who should have been immature and babes in Christ, but people who should have been further along than that and weren't, and he wrote all that stuff to them to correct them. Do you get that? And so sometimes we need First and Second Corinthians because that's where we are. But to, to think that we need to camp out there and think, oh, this is the ultimate right here, that's pretty bad. That's not what he had in mind. And so we've got to get hold of that. We've got to understand that, that these people with the gift of encouragement, they tend, to be, they tend to be discerning. And then the next thing is they have the ability to visualize what people could be if they just grew up. To, to visualize what they could be. Encouragers have the ability to visualize spiritual achievement for other believers, and then, and then they have the ability to recommend practical steps of action to achieve it. Do you know the Bible gives us all kinds of practical steps of action to get where God wants us to be? To get from point A to point B to point C to point D. He, he gives us practical steps of action to get where we're supposed to be. And encouragers have the ability to, to kind of pull that out and, and explain that to people. Paul did that to Timothy. Timothy was his young disciple. And, and Timothy wasn't coming along as, as fast as Paul wanted him to. And so when Paul sensed that Timothy was struggling with spiritual immaturity, this is what he wrote to him. It's in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 22 down to verse 24. Some excerpts from those verses. This is what he said to Timothy. See if you can see some practical steps of action here. First of all, he said, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments and be kind to everyone. Weren't those some practical steps of action? Stop and think about that. Notice those four practical steps of action that Paul recommended to Timothy because he was a young man struggling with spiritual immaturity. Because he was a young man, first thing he said was flee. What does flee mean? Run away. Run away from what? Evil desires of youth. Can we get this right down where we live, young men? You know what he was saying there? You are hormone-ridden, and you're too immature to take care of your passions, and so run away when those evil desires flare up within you. He was telling Timothy, if you don't run away from moral compromise, you're going to get in trouble. Isn't that what he's saying? And so that was a practical step of action for a young man that could be shipwrecked if he didn't keep his passions under control. And so he said to do that. He said, just run away from those evil 
desires of youth. And then do what? Run away from that and run to chase after, pursue righteousness. Pursue whatever it takes to help you do the right thing morally. And then what? And then don't have anything to do with stupid, foolish and stupid arguments. Did you ever notice how young people like to argue about some stuff that doesn't make any difference? We've all done that, haven't we? My kids were growing up. I got two boys, and they were growing up, and they got to be teenagers, and they would argue with one another. And I'd say, boys, that is not worth arguing about. That is stupid. That is not worth arguing about. Why? Because we need that practical steps of action. There are some things that are worth arguing about, but most of the stuff we argue about is pointless. Pointless. And then look at what he says. Be kind. You can get all the rest of it together, but if you are not kind to other people in your approach to them, they are not going to want to hear what you have to say. Isn't that true? So he's given him practical steps of action. That tends to be what encouragers do. They, they visualize what you could be if you had a little more maturity, and then they give you practical steps of action to get there. Now let's look at another one, the gift of giving. The gift of giving. The, the fifth grace gift listed by Paul is that of giving. This is what he wrote in verse um, 8 of Romans 12. If it, that is if your gift is giving, then do what? Give generously. In other words, do what your gift conditions you to do effectively. If your gift is giving, then give generously. The gift of giving is the God-given motivation to wisely invest resources to advance God's kingdom. The gift of giving says that you're in your local church and you see that if your local church had this, they could use this as a great tool to get more people saved and discipled. And, and uh, do all that God wants you to do. If we just had this. And I got the money to make sure we've got that. And the gift of giving will motivate that individual to invest their resources in God's kingdom so that the kingdom of God can be advanced. That's the gift of giving. Not everybody has that gift. That doesn't mean everybody's not supposed to give. But everybody will not be motivated to give like somebody with this gift. The rest of us have to learn to give. You get that? You, you see, here's the deal. Some things come naturally to you because of your gift. Other things that you're supposed to do, whether you got the gift to do it or not, you have to learn to do. You get that? Um, I had to learn to give. What about you? Let's do a survey. How many of you had to learn to give? You didn't really know you were supposed to, and you figured out you were supposed to, and you struggled with it, and you had to learn to do it. Miss Jenny and I were that way. Nobody told us. We, she grew up in church. I was 16 when I got saved, and... And, and we got married when we were 19, and we really didn't know about giving. I mean, we knew that it took money to operate a church, but we didn't really know what the Bible said about giving. And we really didn't give the way we were supposed to give the first few years that we were married. And God let us get hungry a few times, and then we figured it out. I mean, there were times when we ran out a week before, uh, we ran out of groceries before we ran out a week. You know, there were times when, <laughs> when things just didn't go too good for us financially. And then we finally got this, and we finally learned how important it was to tithe, to just give the Lord 10%. But we had to learn to do that. Just, we had to learn to do that. And, and we, we stumbled across Malachi chapter 3, those verses that say, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse and, and see if I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing too big for you to receive. And we said, we've got to start doing this. And we started tithing, and God turned the whole situation around. But we had to learn to do that. People who have the gift of giving, they don't have to learn to do this. It just comes natural to them. And, and they just see an opportunity to invest their resources in the kingdom of God for its advancement. And they're just motivated to do that. In Scripture, Matthew best illustrates a believer with the gift of giving. So if we look at Matthew's life, then that'll help us learn a few characteristics about the givers among us that are among us. Here's one thing about a giver. A giver tends to see value value. You get that? A giver is more concerned about the value than the cost. How many of you ever bought the cheapest one to regret it later? Cheap is not always the value, is it? Cheap is sometimes exactly that, cheap. 
And so we need to get that. Givers have a keen ability to recognize the value of a gift. Matthew was the only gospel writer to mention, in the Christmas story, to mention treasures given to Jesus by the wise men. Not just gifts, but he used the word treasures. Why would he use the word treasures? He saw how valuable the gifts were. He's the only one that mentioned that. Uh, this is what he wrote. Matthew chapter 2, verse number 11. He wrote, they, referring to these wise men, they opened their treasures and they presented to him gifts. They were gifts, but they were treasures. And then he, and then he names them gold and frankincense and myrrh, very valuable commodities in the first century Palestinian world. His use of the word treasures emphasized the extreme value of the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh. M Matthew was also the only one who described the perfume used by Mary to anoint Jesus. You remember Mary Magdalene, the woman that Jesus had cast seven demons out of? And she came to him when he was in the house of a Pharisee one day and, and she brought this expensive perfume and she poured it over his feet. Matthew was the only one who described that perfume as very expensive. What did Matthew see? The value in that perfume. This is what he wrote. It's in Matthew chapter 26, verses 6 and 7. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came in with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. So these people who have the gift of giving often see value that others don't see. Here's another one, purpose. Givers can easily discern God's purpose for providing a gift. Uh, givers tend, tend to be able to look at something and, and, and if the church receives an unexpected gift of some kind, somebody who's a giver can look at that and they can, say, they can understand this is why God gave us this. The rest of us may be saying, wow, what do you think we're supposed to do with this? But the giver can look at that and say, here's God's purpose behind that. This is what God's doing this for. Matthew was the only gospel writer to include the story of the angel. It's, it's in the Christmas story. The story of the angel warning Joseph to take Mary and the baby Jesus and flee to Egypt to prevent King Herod from assassinating the baby. And Matthew placed that story in his gospel immediately after the wise men gave Jesus their treasures. Do you make a connection there? Joseph was a carpenter. Carpenters, unlike today, did not make lots of money in that day and time. They were poor people. They would not have had the resources to suddenly make an unexpected journey to Egypt, traveling to a foreign land and staying there for a couple of years. They would not have had the resources to do that. And Matthew is able to see, ah, that's why the wise men gave them the expensive gifts. They could convert that to cash, travel to Egypt, and live there for two years. And that's why Matthew tells the story like he does. It's in Matthew 2.13. He said, when, when they, that's when the wise men had gone, when they had gone, when they had left Nazareth, where the home of Joseph and Mary were, then an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Obviously, the purpose of the gift of treasures was to provide the resources that would be needed for Joseph and his family to make the long journey to Egypt. And Matthew's the only one who put that in there because he had a gift that enabled him to see that from an entirely different perspective than any of the others. And here's the other thing about givers. Givers are generous. But believers with the grace gift of giving often give generously to projects they see as beneficial to God's kingdom. Now, I've known some givers in my life. Miss Jeannie and I, when I was, uh, when I was 19, is that what, how old I was when we went to Indiana? No, 25. When I was 25, we went to Indiana and and when we went to Indiana, we started a church up there, and God sent this man to our church. 
who was a giver. But he wouldn't give to just anything. He would only give if he could see that it was going to be beneficial to God's kingdom. But when he gave, he gave generously. His name was Wayne. And when he gave, he gave generously, but he wouldn't give to just any project. It had to be something that he could see would actually benefit the kingdom of God. And Matthew, Matthew was one of these generous givers. He saw an opportunity to do something that he thought would benefit this kingdom of God that he had just recently become a citizen of. He had just been saved. And, and, and so Matthew provided this great banquet, not a snack, not a brunch, a great banquet at his home to give his friends the opportunity to listen to Jesus as he taught because he knew that would advance God's kingdom. He knew people would get saved because of that. And so look at what it, look at what it says. Luke wrote about it. Levi, you said, I thought you, thought you said it was Matthew. Do you know that Matthew is sometimes called Levi? Anybody know why? Matthew was his given name, his first name. Levi was his family name. Levi is a common family name among Jewish people. Anybody, anybody know a, a Jewish family, what they're famous for, that traveled uh, back in history, that traveled from Israel and made their home in California and, and started a business, anybody, a clothing business? Levi genes. You see, it's a family name among the Jews. And so Matthew's name was Matthew Levi. And so sometimes he's called by his family name. And so that's what Luke does. Luke says, Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his home. Not just a skimpy little meal, but a what? A great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with him. Not just a few select people, but how? What kind of crowd? A large crowd, a great banquet. I mean, the man pulled out all the stops and didn't spare any expenses. Generously put this deal on so that people could hear Jesus. They would have the opportunity to eat with him and be influenced by him. Matthew didn't provide just your average meal. He generously provided a lavish feast. That's what people with the gift of giving tend to do. Here's another one. Here's a conclusion. Peter wrote this. We, we, we've now talked about Seven of these gifts, or excuse me, five of these gifts, five of the seven. And Peter wrote this, each of you, talking to believers, every one of you, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. So why did God give you a gift to begin with? So you can serve others. The gift that you have been given qualifies you to serve others in a particular way. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Get that. God's grace comes in various forms. It doesn't look the same in any two of our lives. No two of us are doing exactly the same thing as we serve in the body of Christ. Various forms. So we don't need to try to make all Christians look like little tin soldiers all cut out of the same mold. Because we're not. And God's purpose in our lives is not the same. So, an important spiritual lesson to remember is this in order to determine how God has designed you to serve others in his church, you must identify and utilize the grace gift he has given you. Don't worry about what anybody else does or does not do. You be concerned about what God has gifted you to do, and then, uh, it's like the Nike commercial, just do it. <laughs> 